My name is Helen Anderson, and I grew up in what I thought was the ideal American family. We weren't rich at first, but we were happy, just me, mom, and dad living in our modest starter home. My father, James Anderson, was the hardest working man I've ever known. He built his transportation company from the ground up, starting with just two trucks and gradually expanding into a successful business. I remember how he'd sometimes come home covered in grease because he insisted on maintaining the trucks himself in the early days. Mom, Sarah is her name, though I can barely bring myself to call her that anymore, worked as a restaurant manager back then. She was actually good at her job, though she'd constantly complain about it. One day, James, she'd say during dinner, pushing food around her plate, I want to be a proper housewife. All these late nights are killing me. Dad would just smile and pat her hand, promising her that soon she'd be able to quit. And he kept that promise. When I was nine, Dad's business really took off. He landed several major contracts, and suddenly we were moving into this beautiful two-story house in one of the nicest neighborhoods in town. I got my own room, huge and bright, with windows looking out over our backyard. I went wild with the decoration. Pale purple walls, fairy lights everywhere, and this massive bookshelf Dad built himself. He spent an entire weekend on it, cursing under his breath when he thought I couldn't hear him, but beaming with pride when it was finally finished. Mom quit her job shortly after we moved, just like she'd always wanted. Instead of taking care of the house like she'd claimed she wanted to, she was barely ever home. It was always lunch with the girls or just a quick shopping trip or my salon appointment ran late. Dad didn't seem to mind. He was too busy with his company, though he always made time for me. Every Sunday was our day, we'd go for ice cream, and he'd listen to all my stories about school and friends as if they were the most important things in the world. The last time we had ice cream together was just before I turned 11. It was a bright spring day, and Dad was telling me about one of his drivers calling in sick. Guess I'll have to do the run myself tomorrow, he said, finishing his cone. Just like the old days. Can I come with you? I asked, excited at the prospect of a road trip with Dad. He chuckled and ruffled my hair. Not this time, princess. It's just a quick overnight trip. I'll be back before you know it. I remember hugging him extra tight that evening before bed. Love you, Dad, I said, not knowing it would be the last time I'd ever say those words to him. The next morning, he left before dawn. Mom was still asleep, so Maria, our nanny, made his coffee and packed him a lunch. I heard him start his truck and pull out of the driveway. That was the last time I ever saw my father alive. The phone call came at 3.47 a.m. I know because I was awake, unable to sleep due to that strange feeling in my stomach. I heard mom scream from her bedroom, followed by the sound of something breaking, probably her bedside lamp. The next few hours are a blur in my memory. Police officers in our living room. Maria holding me tight while mom paced back and forth, talking on the phone. Words like massive collision and died instantly floating around me like dark butterflies. Dad's truck had collided with a semi that had jackknifed it across the highway. They said he didn't suffer, as if that was supposed to make it better somehow. But nothing made it better. Nothing could bring back my father. The funeral is mostly a haze in my mind. I remember staring at the closed casket, not really believing Dad was inside. Mom put on quite a show, wailing and practically throwing herself across the casket at one point. Looking back now, I realize how theatrical it all was, but at 11, I thought that's just how adults handled grief. It was at the funeral that I met Uncle Robert and Aunt Patricia for the first time. They looked so much like strangers, yet Uncle Robert had Dad's eyes, the same kind, crinkly corners when he tried to smile at me through his tears. Helen, he said, kneeling down to my level. I'm your father's brother. I'm so sorry we're meeting like this. Why haven't I met you before? I remember asking, direct as only kids can be. A shadow crossed his face. Your father and I, we had a disagreement many years ago. But none of that matters now. I had to come say goodbye to my little brother. 
After the funeral, mom's grief evaporated like morning dew. Within weeks, she was meeting with dad's lawyers, taking control of his company, and acting like she knew the first thing about running a transportation business. She started throwing around terms like restructuring and modernization, but it was obvious she was just making things up as she went along. I spent most of my time with Maria, who would shake her head sadly whenever mom came home with shopping bags from expensive stores. Your mother's spending money like water, Maria muttered one day while making my lunch. Those poor drivers haven't been paid properly in weeks. She was right. Dad's employees started quitting one by one. These were men and women who'd worked for him for years, some since the beginning. I remembered their names, their faces, how they used to bring me little presents from their routes. Now they were leaving, unable to feed their families on promises and excuses. Six months after dad's death, mom sold what was left of his company for a fraction of what it had been worth. She acted like she'd made some brilliant business decision, but everyone knew the truth, she'd run dad's life's work into the ground. After the sale of dad's company, mom was rarely home, always out somewhere, and I spent most of my time with Maria. She'd started teaching me Spanish, saying it would come in handy someday. I spent a lot of time at the library after school. It was better than coming home to an empty house. Mom would breeze in late at night, sometimes smelling of wine, barely acknowledging my existence. Oh, you're still up, she'd say, as if surprised to find me in my own home. Then she'd disappear into her room, and I wouldn't see her again until the next evening, if at all. Then came that Sunday night. I was doing homework in the kitchen when mom burst through the door, giggling like a teenager. She wasn't alone. Helen, sweetie, she called out, her voice thick with fake enthusiasm. Come meet Richard. Richard was tall and wore an expensive suit that somehow still looked cheap. His smile didn't reach his eyes when he looked at me. Helen, mom said, clutching Richard's arm like a lifeline, Richard and I got married last weekend. He's your new father. We're going to be a proper family again. I already had a proper family, I said, my voice shaking. I already have a father. Richard's fake smile disappeared. Listen here, young lady, he said, his voice stern. Your mother and I are married now. You need to accept that and show some respect. You're not my father, I spat back. You'll never be my father. See what I mean? Richard turned to mom. Difficult child. Needs discipline. But Richard moving in was just the beginning. Within a week, his mother Gloria, his sister Janet, and his 12-year-old niece Madison had all moved in too. They took over the house like an invading army, rearranging furniture and changing the decor mom and dad had picked out together. Mom didn't seem to mind. She and Janet became instant best friends, spending hours shopping and gossiping. Gloria took over the kitchen, complaining about Maria's cooking until mom fired her. I lost the only person who still cared about me in that house. Then came the final blow. I came home from school one day to find Madison in my room, my room that dad had built the bookshelf in, my room with the purple walls and fairy lights. What are you doing? I demanded. Aunt Sarah said I could have this room, Madison smirked. It's bigger than the guest room, and I need space for all my things. Get out! I screamed. This is my room. Not anymore, she taunted, throwing my books off the shelves. Your mom says you're moving to the small room down the hall. I lost it. I lunged at Madison, and we both went down in a tangle of arms and legs. I pulled her hair while she scratched at my face, both of us screaming. Richard and mom ran in, pulling us apart. Helen, mom shrieked. How dare you? Go to your new room right now. No. This is my room. Dad gave it to me. Richard grabbed my arm roughly. Your father is dead, he snarled. This is my house now, and you'll do as you're told. They locked me in the small guest room for two days, only letting me out for school and bathroom breaks. My books and things were piled in boxes in the corner. Dad's bookshelf was thrown out with the trash. Through the wall, I could hear Madison playing music in my old room, and mom laughing with Janet downstairs like nothing was wrong. 
A few weeks after the room incident, I was heading to the bathroom late at night when I heard voices from downstairs. I crept to the top of the stairs, staying in the shadows. The girl is becoming more difficult every day, Richard was saying. She's disrupting our family harmony. Have you considered finding her another home? My heart stopped. Another home? You mean adoption? Mom asked, and my blood ran cold at how thoughtful she sounded. I suppose that could work. She's still young enough. It would be better for everyone, Janet added. Madison's afraid of her after that attack, and honestly, she doesn't fit in here anymore. I ran back to my room, buried my face in my pillow, and told myself they couldn't mean it. Mom wouldn't give me away. She couldn't. I pushed the conversation to the back of my mind, convincing myself it was just talk. Two months later, my 13th birthday arrived. I wasn't expecting much, my birthdays hadn't been celebrated since Dad died. But to my surprise, Uncle Robert and Aunt Patricia showed up at the door. Happy birthday, Helen, Uncle Robert said, hugging me tight. His eyes narrowed when Richard walked past, ignoring us completely. Mom had thrown together a hasty dinner, probably embarrassed that Dad's brother might judge her. The tension around the table was thick enough to cut with a knife. Then Mom cleared her throat. Actually, Robert, Patricia, I'm glad you're here. There's something I need to discuss. Something in her tone made my stomach clench. Helen isn't happy here, Mom continued, not looking at me. And frankly, we're not happy either. She doesn't fit in with our new family dynamic. I've decided to put her up for adoption. The words hit me like a physical blow. The conversation I'd overheard hadn't been just talk after all. I thought, since you and Patricia don't have children of your own, Mom continued, her voice casual as if she were discussing the weather, you might want to take her. If not, I'll start looking for other families. The room spun. I couldn't breathe. On my birthday. She was giving me away on my birthday. Uncle Robert's chair scraped back so violently it fell over. We'll take her, he thundered, his face red with fury. And you, Sarah, are the most despicable excuse for a mother I've ever seen. How dare you? Richard started to stand, but one look from Uncle Robert made him sink back into his chair. Patricia, Uncle Robert said, his voice gentler, help Helen pack her things. We're leaving now. Aunt Patricia wrapped an arm around my shaking shoulders and led me upstairs. We packed quickly, throwing my clothes and few remaining possessions into bags. I was crying so hard I could barely see. It's going to be okay, sweetheart, Aunt Patricia kept whispering. We've got you now. I walked out of that house without looking back at mom. She didn't try to stop me, didn't try to say goodbye. The last thing I heard as Uncle Robert closed the car door was Madison asking if she could have my new room too. The transition wasn't easy at first. I'd wake up in my new room at Uncle Robert and Aunt Patricia's house, momentarily confused about where I was. But then I'd smell Aunt Patricia's coffee and bacon wafting up from the kitchen, and remember that I was home, my real home. The adoption process moved quickly. Mom signed away her rights without hesitation, which hurt at the time but eventually felt like a blessing. Uncle Robert and Aunt Patricia became mom and dad on paper, making official what was already true in my heart. Helen, Uncle Robert said one morning over breakfast, we enrolled you in Riverside Prep. It's a better school than your old one, and we think you'll like it there. I did like it there. Without the constant stress of my old home life, I started doing better in classes. My teachers noticed, and so did my new parents. They came to everything, every school play, every academic awards ceremony, every parent-teacher conference. When I joined the debate club, they sat through every competition, beaming with pride even when I lost. They encouraged me to try new things. Piano lessons, summer science camps, volunteering at the local animal shelter, they supported it all. Not just with money, but with genuine interest and involvement. The pain of my mother's rejection faded gradually, replaced by the warm certainty of being truly loved. I stopped thinking about her stopped wondering if she ever thought about me. My new life was too full, 
too happy for those old hurts to matter anymore. High school graduation came, and I had the loudest cheering section in the audience, not just Uncle Robert and Aunt Patricia, but their whole extended family who had embraced me as their own. We have something to tell you, Aunt Patricia said at my graduation dinner. We've been saving for your college funds since the day you came to live with us. They'd put aside enough to send me to any school I chose. I picked State University's business school, planning to major in investment management. College was incredible. I threw myself into my studies, determined to make them proud. During my junior year internship at Goldman Sachs, Aunt Patricia mentioned casually that she'd run into my birth mother at the grocery store. She has a son now, Aunt Patricia said carefully, watching my reaction. They're still in your father's old house with Richard's family. I just nodded, surprised to feel nothing but mild curiosity. That life seemed like a distant dream now, happening to someone else. After graduation, I landed a job at Morgan Stanley. My starting salary made my eyes pop, it was more money than I'd ever imagined making right out of college. The day I got my first paycheck, I went straight to the jewelry store. Uncle Robert had been wearing the same worn-out watch for years, and Aunt Patricia had been eyeing a particular pearl necklace in a local shop window. When I gave them their gifts, Aunt Patricia started crying, and Uncle Robert's hands shook as he put on his new watch. You shouldn't have spent your money on us, he protested weakly. Who else would I spend it on? I asked, hugging them both. You're my parents. You're the ones who made all of this possible. Six years flew by after college. I climbed the corporate ladder at Morgan Stanley, earning promotion after promotion until I was managing my own team. Every success felt sweeter because I could share it with mom and dad, as I now called Uncle Robert and Aunt Patricia without hesitation. The apartment came first, a beautiful two-bedroom condo in a nice part of the city. Mom helped me decorate it, and dad insisted on checking all the paperwork before I signed the mortgage. Then I met Michael. A year of dating, and he proposed during a weekend trip to the beach. I said yes, before he even finished asking the question. Mom cried when we told them, and dad pulled Michael into a bear hug. Welcome to the family, son, he said, his voice gruff with emotion. We threw ourselves into wedding planning. Mom and I spent weekends looking at venues and tasting cakes, while Dad and Michael bonded over budget spreadsheets and vendor contracts. Then the message arrived on Facebook. Helen, sweetheart. I've heard about your upcoming wedding. I know it's been a long time, but I'm still your mother. I've changed, and I want to make things right. Please let me be part of your special day. I miss you so much. My hand shook as I read the message. I immediately called Mom. I saw Sarah yesterday, Mom said quietly when I told her about the message. At the grocery store. She didn't ask about you, not once. But when I mentioned how successful you've become, how you're getting married, well, her eyes lit up in a way I didn't like. Mom hesitated before continuing. There's more. That niece of her husband's, Madison? She got pregnant, married some deadbeat, and moved back into the house with her husband. The whole family is constantly fighting. Sarah was complaining about money problems, rather loudly, in the middle of the store. I felt a cold knot form in my stomach. So that's why she reached out. She needs money. I stared at the message for a long time before responding. My fingers hovered over the keyboard as memories flooded back, the room she gave away, the birthday she threw me away, the years of silence when she had every opportunity to reach out but didn't. Finally, I typed. Sarah, let me be clear, you are not my mother. You lost that right when you gave me away on my 13th birthday. I have parents who love me unconditionally, something you never managed to do. I don't want you at my wedding. I don't want you in my life. Don't contact me again. I hit send, then immediately blocked her. My hands were steady now, my mind clear. I felt lighter somehow, as if I'd finally put down a weight I didn't know I was carrying. The morning of my wedding dawned perfect and clear. Michael's parents had rented the Mason Creek estate for the ceremony, a beautiful historic property with sprawling gardens and a restored Victorian mansion. 
I was in the bridal suite with mom, putting the finishing touches on my makeup, when there was a knock at the door. Ms. Anderson? One of the security guards looked uncomfortable. I'm sorry to disturb you, but there's a situation at the front gate. There are some people insisting they know you, a man, woman, and teenage boy. My stomach dropped. Somehow, I knew exactly who it was. I'll handle this, I said, standing up carefully in my wedding dress. Helen, you don't have to, mom started, but I shook my head. Yes, I do. Once and for all. I walked to the front gates, my wedding heels clicking against the cobblestone path. And there they were, Sarah, Richard, and a boy who must have been my half-brother, though he looked exactly like Madison. Helen! Sarah screamed when she saw me, grabbing the iron bars of the gate. How dare you not invite your own mother to your wedding? Let us in immediately. I took a moment to really look at her. She'd aged poorly, her designer clothes were obviously last seasons, her makeup too heavy, her hair desperately in need of a touch-up. Richard looked thinner, more haggard, the expensive suit replaced by something off the rack. Richard should be the one walking you down the aisle, Sarah continued, her voice shrill. He's your father. That made me laugh, a genuine, hearty laugh that echoed across the courtyard. My father? The man who locked me in a room for two days? The man who helped you throw away your own daughter? We're family, Sarah's voice cracked. You can't just pretend we don't exist. Look at how you're living, this fancy wedding, your big job, your expensive clothes. Meanwhile, we can barely make ends meet. We're drowning in debt, and you're here playing princess. Ah, there it was. The real reason for this dramatic appearance. I'm not playing at anything, I said coldly. I worked for everything I have. And let's be clear, you're not my family. You gave up that right years ago. My parents are inside that house. They're the ones who raised me, supported me, loved me unconditionally. You need our help, Sarah was practically foaming at the mouth now. After everything we did for you. Everything you did for me? I cut her off. You mean throwing me away like garbage? Taking away my room, my home, my childhood? That's what you did for me. I turned to the security guards. These people are strangers who are trespassing. Please remove them from the property. They are not welcome here. You can't do this, Sarah screamed as the guards moved forward. I'm your mother. No, I said firmly. You're just the woman who gave birth to me. There's a difference. I turned my back on her continued screams and walked away, my head held high. When I returned to the bridal suite, mom was waiting with a worried expression. Are you okay, sweetheart? I took a deep breath and smiled. You know what? I've never been better. That chapter of my life is finally, completely closed. There was a knock at the door, and dad poked his head in. Ready, princess? I looked in the mirror one last time, adjusting my veil. The woman looking back at me wasn't that scared 13-year-old girl anymore. I was strong, successful, and loved, truly loved. I'm ready, I said, taking dad's arm. The wedding march began to play as we approached the garden ceremony. I could see Michael waiting at the altar, beaming at me with tears in his eyes. Our guest stood, turning to watch as dad walked me down the aisle. This was how it should be, the man who taught me to drive, who helped me with my college applications, who showed me what a father's love really means, was the one giving me away. The ceremony was perfect. Michael and I exchanged our vows under a blue sky, surrounded by flowers and the people who truly loved us. When he kissed me for the first time as my husband, our guests erupted in cheers. The reception lasted well into the night. Dad gave a touching speech that had everyone crying, then made everyone laugh with embarrassing stories from my college years. Mom danced with Michael while I danced with Dad, and I couldn't stop smiling. That was six months ago. Michael and I just got back from our honeymoon in Greece, and life has settled into a wonderful new normal. Sometimes people ask me about my real parents, and I tell them truthfully that my real parents are the ones who chose me, who loved me, who shaped me into the person I am today.
I don't know what happened to Sarah and her family after the wedding, and honestly, I don't care. I heard through the grapevine that they had to sell dad's old house, but that's not my concern anymore. That part of my life is over. My story isn't about being abandoned or betrayed. It's about finding your real family, the people who love you not because they have to, but because they want to. It's about choosing happiness over bitterness, forgiveness over anger, and moving forward instead of looking back. I'm Helen Anderson Mitchell now, and I couldn't be happier with the way things turned out. Every morning, I wake up next to a man who loves me completely, and every Sunday, we have dinner with the parents who chose me and never let me go.